You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, Thunderbird 4 visits the Sea of Tranquility in Fab Fact. A very special guest is sending the randomizer into orbit. And Into Infinity continues with a sample of a new Planetfall audiobook read by Robbie Stevens. Cool, that's all coming up in pod 123. Don't you know it of the Jerry Addison Podcast? Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Ah, one, two, three. I love that. Yes, it's it, the first time we've had three, three consecutive numbers. Obviously, we've done sixty-seven and eighty-nine <laughs> previously, haven't we? But never three together. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so uh, that's very exciting. Uh, and in the standard Richard James way, I wonder how many episodes it'll be until we have one, two, three, four. <laughs> Quite a few, Richard, that's all I can tell you. You're listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast and you're welcome to it. Welcome to the next hour and a half. That's Jamie Anderson sat over there, son of the legendary TV maker, producer, writer, Jerry Anderson. And I'm Richard James, son of the legendary, uh, well, he was a works manager at um, A1 Plant, William James. Nice. Uh, Also, Richard, you're forgetting husband of... That's top-notch true. editor charlotte yes, Serple. that's true enough and uh, chris dale will be joining us a little bit later on for his amazing randomizer once again we also have some fab facts coming up for your delectation mm. we've got some news from the jerry anderson universe do we because there's always you know, uh, come on there's got to be something that's yeah, happened over right. last week i can think of a couple of things just off the top of my head we've also got some uh, emails and some uh, twitterings and some facebook groupings from our podstrons to be read out a little later on and Well, something rather special for our special feature this week, Jamie. Oh, yes, you're right. So Mm. we're not doing an interview for the third Mm -hmm. week in a row, would you believe it? But we are Mm -hmm. giving you free content in the form of a couple of free chapters of Into Infinity, Planetfall. Nice. Read by Robbie Stevens, written by Gregory Mm -hmm. L. Norris. Mm -hmm. uh, And it's a follow-up to the TV pilot Into Infinity, off of the 70s. Uh, right remember it well yes so you'll enjoy that if you've uh, I mean there's lots of people who've been waiting since the 1970s to see what happens to the crew of the Altaris and now you'll finally discover what happens imagine that just 44 years later yes well no one said it was going to be quick (laughs) it certainly wasn't but there you go that's some free stuff coming up there'll probably be other bits and pieces we talk about oh yeah you know messages from people and stuff like that and yeah probably wander off in a random direction talk tangentially we normally do that don't we almost certainly mm, something okay. will catch your eye and off you'll go but to keep us on track should we dive yeah. straight into a fab fact okay here we go now time for this week's fab facts richard james yes jamie anderson as well you know this is fab facts where i've got a book of fab facts i flick through it you shout fab i stop flicking there and then i read a fab fact from the page where i stop flicking are you ready to shout fab because i'm ready to flick i'm ready here we go. Fab! Oh, hey, how did I do? You did very well. Oh. 1967 is where we find oh, ourselves right. today. Crikey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, it's one of those recycling facts. All right, what you mean, what we've done before? <laughs> no, we're not recycling the facts, but the fact uh, is about recycling, do you see? I see, I see. Captain Scarlet, Richard James, one of your favourite series. Yep. An iconic guest vehicle mm. from that series, as seen in Lunaville 7 and Crater 101, was the Moonmobile. Oh, yes. Sort of a grasshopper-like thing which bounces mm. around the lunar surface. Well, the exterior was new, but the interior was not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can, can you say that once more with feeling, please? Yeah, no, right. Ah, uh, That's better, thank you. Yeah. The interior of the Captain Scarlet Moonmobile was, in fact, a redressed interior from a previous production. But can you guess which production, Richard James? A previous Jerry Anderson production? Yes. Well, there weren't many, were there, before Captain Scarlet? Well, go ahead and take a guess, then. 
Well, I mean, the biggest one was Thunderbirds. Okay, fine. Uh, you, no, no, could have been some... you've, you've got it. You've got what? it in one. You've got it in one. Okay, Makes well, sense, I mean, isn't it? Because obvious. they'd have a load yeah. of Thunderbird stuff just before You'd Scarlet. Think. Yeah. But which interior was redressed? You'd think maybe right. Moomobile, something that went into space, so, like Thunderbird uh, so 3 or Thunderbird craft, 5? I see, yes. Either Thunderbird 3 or Thunderbird 5, perhaps. No, yeah. Well, it wasn't those. Oh. It was, in fact, Thunderbird 4. Really? Yeah. Okay. So... There's not a lot in those two Scarlet episodes, Lunaville 7 and Crater 101, to indicate where the set came from beyond the curved walls of the set and the red airlock door at the rear of the cabin. Ah. But what actually confirms it as the old Thunderbird 4 set is a photograph of the pop group The Spectrum. Who sang the end title song? You know, at the end of the, the oh, right, final yes. eighteen oh, episodes of the They were an actual the show. group. They were I an see. actual group, and they ah. dressed up in scarlet stuff, and they did a load I of. I thought uh, they were just sort of a, an assembled, you know, group of musicians, you know, freelancers who were just pulled in to do a song. No, they were an actual, oh. an actual group, and uh, yeah. they did all sorts of promo stuff. And in fact, on the Captain Scarlet Blu-rays, there's a great promo thing of them driving round Carnaby Street in a mini moke, I think. Great. That's anyway, so sixties. There is a picture of them posing with their puppet counterparts, mm-hmm. scarlet blue. Green, ochre, and magenta are stood on that set where you can see the yellow and red exterior intake grill of Thunderbird 4 still attached to that set. Uh, and that proves it without a doubt. Now, if yes. you want to see a photo of that, then I suggest you pop along to the Facebook group or you'll see the video version of this. In fact, you may be watching it right now of Fab Facts, which will be out the Wednesday after the podcast is released. And you can oh, yes. see the images to prove it beyond doubt. Yeah. Yeah. So they did a pretty good job of disguising Thunderbird 4 in this case, because some things are really, really obvious. But mm-hmm. in this case, they did a great job. But it's uh, thanks to the eagle eyes of one... Uh, who's this? Christopher Dale. Oh, right, yes. Yeah, yes, of, mm. uh, of England, United Very Kingdom. Very keen young man, obviously. Uh, who spotted this and, uh, and proved it. So thank you, Chris. We'll come back to you later for your randomizer. Mm-hmm. If you've spotted a reused set in any Anderson production, do pop us an email, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. But I think for now, that brings us to the end of this week's Recycled Fact. Yeah, it's just like we're recycling our old guests, aren't we? Nicholas Briggs a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you were next? talking about having Samira Ahmed on at some point again. Yes, yeah. she's hopefully going to come back and talk UFO. So, yes, yeah. I think, uh, I mean, it's only right that in you know today's world that we should be doing our bit oh. for the recycling effort. Yes, by recycling Nicholas Briggs. Yes, quite right. <laughs> yeah, very good. So do get in touch if you spot anything that's been used again in any of the Jerry Anderson series. Now, talking of getting in touch, Jamie, people have been emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and I thought I would just take a little time out of the podcast to read you what they've been saying. Well, please, what a surprise. Now, Joe Etheridge got in touch to say, Hello, Jamie, Richard and Chris. A thought just came to me. Whenever I hear the scary music and audio on Torchy the Battery Boy, I always hear battery, as in the assault crime. This makes uh, sense, as Torchy seems to commit battery every episode to all the children. Was this meant, he says, liking a lot of uh, children's shows, there are lots of uh, innuendo or adult themes. Sorry for the dark subject, but this has made me laugh. Uh, He continues, I'm catching up with the podcasts as I only started listening a few weeks ago. I'm up to the 30th pod, but listening to the most recent pods when they are published. So 100 odd to go, he says. Imagine that. That's quite (laughs) a mountain to climb, isn't it? So, uh, well, well done, Joe. Yes, it's interesting. We talked about the sort of um, uh, Halloween-esque images from Jerry Anderson shows last week, didn't we? It's funny, for such a colourful and supposedly family genre, uh, the Jerry Anderson shows, they do have their dark side, don't they? And sometimes get quite nightmarish. I mean, he points to Torchy the Battery Boy there, but of course we've got uh, Dragon's Domain from Space 1999, even Commander, the sort of vampire figure from Space Precinct, and Captain Scarlet is well known for its darker themes, and UFO talks about, you know, organ transplantation and so on. It's not as cuddly as people might think, is it, Jerry Anderson? Definitely not. But why no. Why would it be? Part of the yeah. thing of science fiction is to be scared. You want some peril and danger and real stuff going on in there that actually makes you feel under threat. Yes, so I think Which it's is why only, we do the podcast. It's, <laughs> it's only right. Yes, <laughs> it is our dangerous game. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Torchy, unintentionally creepy. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I do hope that you've all picked up your Porky the Butchery Boy Halloween t-shirt by now. If not... That's great. He'll be coming to get you. Ooh. Yes, nightmarish things like Dragon's Domain, 
awesome. And yeah. I, I just think, I'm sure there was that. You remember the 30 Years in the TARDIS, Richard, that uh, documentary? I am aware of it, Jamie, yes. There's a thing where somebody, I can't remember. There's something quite scary in that, isn't there? Yes. Uh, yes, all right, thank you. Somebody in that says about the kiddies like to be scared in a controlled way. Right. And yeah. I think that's right. You know, yeah. there is a pleasure in being scared in a controlled yeah. and protected environment like watching this. That's television. what I tell my children anyway. Yes, uh, now Hannah also got in touch to say, hello, I hope you're both still coping with what's uh, been going on recently. I'm coping fine by making models, drawing pictures and listening to the podcast. Listening to Mark Woolard's time with Jerry was very interesting, says Hannah. Uh, this is going back to an interview with Mark Woolard a few pods ago. Hearing uh, from the fans is fun to listen to, she says, but I think the ones who worked with Jerry are the best ones for me. It gives me an insight of what he was like and the things he went through during his career. I guess it was not always plain sailing. She says, I've downloaded your audiobook, Richard Space Precinct Unmasked, to hear, and she says, I can't stop listening to it. Working in film sounds like it has its ups and downs. It can be a great place to work, and then it can be very a very cruel place, and things don't go the way you want it. It's a shame it wasn't given a second chance to have a second series. Never mind, let's just be happy with what we've got. Absolutely right. And of course, well, the story of Space Precinct continues in Space Precinct Revisited and Demeter City, available from Jerry Anson's store and Big Finish. A couple of audio books there. And we've also heard from Anthony, who says, Dear Richard James Anderson, see what I did there? In a word, he says, Fab is fab. Uh, This is First Action Bureau, a brand new series from uh, Nicholas Briggs and Jamie Anderson and Anderson Entertainment, set in a futuristic, utopian, Jerry Anderson-esque world. He says it's certainly more gritty and has a strong female cast, though the Jerry Anderson essence is still there throughout. Is it wrong to feel sorry for Richard's voiced robot, he says? It seems uh, to be the most empathetic or rather empathic and likeable character in the series. How many times does Jamie say, ignore advice behind the scenes during the Jerry Addison podcast? Has Richard missed a calling as a sat-nav voice, he continues. The robot voice would be uh, genteel about missing a wrong turn, but in another character, he might make cutting remarks or sing at the uh, destination. That was the route. That was the route. (laughs) Anyway, he says, I notice that there's a different reader for volume two of Gemini Force. Does that apply, uh, or rather, does that imply that a new reader uh, that there'll be a new reader for volume three cheers from anthony well i'm glad you're enjoying first action bureau and richard did do a fantastic job as the uh, bureau computer <laughs> in fact sometimes <laughs> i speak to you richard and you just speak to me as the computer randomly i do yes for no particular Advice reason ignored. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, it's lovely now uh, gemini force one jacob dudman read book one but uh, mm-hmm. jacob is a very popular and very busy young actor. He is. And unfortunately, he just wasn't available to record this for us. So Wayne took up the reins, and he's done a fantastic yeah. job. And I think we'll probably stick with Wayne Forrester for, oh, okay. uh, for book three. Yeah. I mean, he's re-established the characters in his own voice, and uh, we'll probably stick with that for White Storm, which will be out early 2021. Great. And he's certainly an Anderson voice, isn't he? So that's uh, it's always good to hear. I believe he is. I think yes. he's in something called... Um, First Action action Bureau? Bureau. Yes, I think you might be right. If it's an accent, it's Wayne, essentially. That's that's the thing with First Action Bureau. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't it? I thought you said, if it's acting, it's Wayne. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Now, uh, Steve got in touch to say, hi, Chris, Richard and Jamie. I'm with Jamie, he says. So this goes back to a couple of pods. You'll remember what we were talking about as he goes on. This is about UFO being ripe for a reboot or not. He says, although both uh, Space 1999 and UFO are set in the not-too-distant future, Space 1999, by virtue of being set in space, has far fewer technical or cultural references reference points, making it way more flexible and adaptable to reinterpretation. UFO, on the other hand, has a lot more in the way of fashion of the day. Future fashions are naturally uh, always tied to current notions of the future. In decor, clothing, vehicles, sexual attitudes, buildings, behaviour, smoking, for example, on Moonbase, and the rest, due to being set mostly on Earth, which embodies this cultural weight. And he has a thought. Is anyone in Space 1999 ever seen smoking? He says, I think that these are distinct virtues of the feel of each show and why I love both of them. For their particular character as well as their stories. As Jamie said, UFO is a time capsule of the 70s in a way that, interestingly, Space 1999 is not, apart from the platform shoes and flares. That's just my two pennies worth anyway, says Stephen. Yeah, thank you for that. Very interesting. And uh, sort of does agree with you there, Jamie, that a UFO perhaps not suitable for today's uh, environment, but Space 1999 is always ripe for a retelling and a reboot. I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, you know, there's no right answer on these things, is there? No, no, true. But uh, yeah, so it is those points about the kind of 
how the retro futurism works and might not work if it was replaced by a modern sci-fi approach so thank yeah. you for your two penneth and for agreeing with me most important yeah that's right which is always welcome <laughs> and finally ed dutra has got in touch again ed say dutra. hello jamie richard and chris well done uh, for it was a red, right. thank you very much it was a red letter day at the mailbox yesterday says ed not only did i receive the breakaway 2020 shirt enclosed in a snazzy metallic blue wrap that reminded me of the alpha jacket material in deaths of a dominion but I also received the Demeter City and Space Precinct Unmarked books, the latter signed by one Richard James. Uh, he says, I finished Space Precinct Unmasked in one sitting, which may not have been the healthiest thing for me to do. You see, as I was reading the words, my brain was translating them into Richard's voice in my head. Don't get me wrong, this makes for a highly entertaining experience. However, once I put the book down and went about the rest of my day, I realised that I was stuck. Everything I read or everything I read now, is being internally translated into Richard's voice. I think the only cure for this is to listen to the audio downloads, kind of like cancelling out an annoying, but nonetheless charming, earworm. <laughs> you should put that on your spotlight CV, Richard James. <laughs> annoying, but nonetheless charming. Yeah, I think mm. that's probably fair. Yeah, and finally he says, by the way, any updates on the big chief figure of Chris Dale? Or was that just something I recall from a fever dream I had during the recent heat wave? Regards, Ed Dutra. <laughs> I would love a big Chief Studios, Chris Dale. Ah, I would love that too. But I fear we may be waiting some time for it. <laughs> yes, but uh, never mind. We've still got the real thing coming up a bit later on, of course, with his latest randomizer. Oh, but yeah. that's all for now on the email front. Do keep them coming in. Podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and I'll read them out next time. Who needs a sixth scale Chris Dale when you've got yes. a one-to-one scale version coming up in a bit exactly yeah perfect now richard james oh yes i feel like we need some news (gasps) is there any of course there's some news and it's coming up right now it's the Derry anson news Here it comes. Mm -hmm. (gasps) News, 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 news. First up, our Halloween range is here. I know it's a bit early, but surely you want these things in time for Halloween, right? Mm -hmm. Chris Thompson has done a couple of fantastic designs, and Lee Sullivan has joined us for a third one. Chris is too, a Dragon's Domain design, obviously designed to make you wet the bed, potentially. Sorry about that. With the fearsome dragon on the front with its glowing eye. It's rather lovely. Oh. And a Jerry Anderson villains t-shirt. Sort of, you know, a collection of them as if they've just been arrested. It's looking rather smart, so you might like that. Any of you who remember Fab Live Live from, oh gosh, was it last year at the Space Centre? I guess it might have been. Yes. Anyway, Lee Sullivan was there and he did a fantastic Torchy the Battery Boy thing. Porky the Butchery Boy, I think, made up by Richard. Clever you, Richard. Well done. Mm-hmm. Well, we've turned it into a proper illustration and you can now get Porky the Butchery Boy, our Torchy the Battery Boy parody on a T-shirt and a mug, should you wish to do so. It's pretty terrifying if I do say so myself. This Monday, oh gosh, that's today if you're listening on the day of release, we'll see the end of the road for a couple of designs in the store. We are making way for new stuff coming into the end of the year and into 2021. It's very exciting, but that means we have to make some space so some stuff is on its way out and that includes, ooh, a wasp embroidered bag and a list of the brothers tracy brothers mug and a few other bits and pieces anyway just head over and look for the clearance section or go to ander.sn slash clearance that's our new uh, earl shortener your earl shortener a-n-d-r dot s-n slash clearance and you will find it there or maybe it's slash farewell. Try them both. Good luck. Uh, First Action Bureau episode six is coming up this week on Thursday, so don't forget to tune in. I can't believe it. If you haven't subscribed, I should be really upset. So please do pop along and uh, subscribe to First Action Bureau and give it a go if you haven't tried already. I know we are still in October, but Christmas is just around the corner and the Thunderbirds Christmas jumper is in stock and readily available. And if you're looking for something to do as you face, potentially in the UK, especially the prospect of, uh, of lockdown, yeah, you can grab a Jerry Anderson vehicle size chart jigsaw puzzle. That rather lovely image that Chris Thompson put together of all the uh, the vehicles from across the Andiverse, all in comparative size chart. It's a thousand piece puzzle. It should keep you busy. And uh, we've just got a prototype set of 50 puzzles. So there aren't that many in stock. So uh, just pop along to the Jerry Anderson store and search for jigsaw. 
We've got some cool stuff coming up on YouTube. This coming Saturday, you should be able to see a premiere of another Firestorm Minisode test, very short one, that we did on a shoestring budget of, uh, well, about zero, enough to buy the crew coffee and bacon sarnies. And that's called Wake Up Call, and it will premiere at 10.30am this coming Saturday, so make sure you watch that. There's also some other Halloween spooky stuff coming to the YouTube channel in due course. And... um, well, I think that's about it. Other than the uh, the big Finnish audiobooks out now, Space Precinct Revisited, Gemini Force One Ghost Mine, and uh, Into Infinity Planetfall, which you're hearing today uh, in our feature, they are all out and available from the Jerry Ann store or from bigfinish.com. If you want to use the Big Finish app, go to bigfinish.com and get it there. Don't get it through us because it won't work in your app. But if you don't use an app, then... Um, Get it from the Jerry Anson store, wherever you like. Nice. Right, that's it. We're done. This week's Jerry Anson news is over. That was the news. That was the news. A little bit lighter this week, but um, yeah, yeah. I think we all deserved a break, didn't we? Oh, I think you're right. It was a bit of an opus magnum. Magnum <laughs> opus. Last week, wasn't it? Yes. It's those chocolate lollies with the ice cream inside. Uh, y- yeah, yeah. Those, lovely. Not a Solero, though. No, no. Mm. Who'd Ma- have a Solero over a Magnum? <laughs> Well, a monster. If you're the sort of monster who'd have a Solero instead of a Magnum, do let us know. Podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. <laughs> oh, great. It's so, uh, so much stuff going on. It's amazing, isn't it? Brand new Jerry Anderson stuff happening all the time. Lovely merchandise. Great stuff to watch on our YouTube channel. Great stuff to download and listen to via First Action Bureau. I mean, I keep going. I was watching Planet of Bones again the other week, and that's always a joy to watch as well. So go back and have a look at that on the YouTube channel. There's just stuff around. Uh, yes, there? rather reassuringly. Yeah. Yes, lots and lots coming, and lots more to come too, Ooh. especially with the thing I hinted at last week with a yes. bit of a change of um, our abilities and what we can put together for you. Uh, yeah. I shall say right. no more. I feel like All I'm right. breaching some sort of confidentiality or something. Oh. Wouldn't be the first time. Uh, all right. Thank you very mm. much. Uh, have you got anything else from around the, uh, the universe, Richard, before we move on to um, other bits and pieces like our freebie book? chapters for the week of course i have oh, I uh, you might. I, uh, <laughs> head on to our facebook group see what they've been doing there just a reminder that jamie mentioned last week a great thing for you to do would be to sum up the jerry anderson podcast in 10 words or less in a sort of a review pop it on twitter and hashtag us jerry anderson podcast pop it on the facebook group or email it to us and we'll read some out uh, in a few weeks or so can you describe your favorite parts of the jerry anderson podcast using 10 or fewer words let's see them now over on our facebook group facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podstrons alex pass has written i've just finished rereading the indestructible man by simon messingham a sort of doctor who jerry anderson crossover that's the one we talked about last that's week right. weirdly, isn't exactly. it? exactly yep so alex has been uh, looking at that again he says there's lots of little things like a global response rescue organisation with a genius inventor, security groups called PRISM and Silhouette, with a sky home flying base protected by the cherubs, a submarine called Manta and Seward, space early warning and radar detection, the titular indestructible man even wears a red uniform. That being said, it's got a storyline way bleaker than anything even the most sobering episode of Captain Scarlet or UFO ever threw at us. Never mind an episode of the late 60s Doctor Who. So yes, how interesting. So that's The Indestructible Man by Simon Messingham, a sort of Doctor Who Jerry Anderson crossover that we spoke about last week. How bizarre that that should crop up now. Um, yes, I would love to see that done as a, as a big finish, perhaps, but I think it's a BBC oh. Books title, which means it can't be ah, um, really? for licensing purposes, which is a great Gosh. shame, because that would be really yeah. fun, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be a shame. Never mind. Yeah. Uh, Richard, you mentioned those 10-word reviews. I have actually had one in by email. Have you now? Yes. Good. Mm-hmm. It reads as follows. Yes. Richard is amazing. Oh, right. Yeah, great. Chris yeah. is fantastic. Yes. Take or leave, Jamie. Ah, I'm, I'm glad you got that. I That's was worried bit. it hadn't got through. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. yes, hmm? I've just seen who it's from. Yes. Yeah, Richard uh, Anyway, Anthony Blunt also wrote on our Facebook group, I'm just watching through uh, Space Precinct, currently on the Forever Beetle. I could swear I heard the voice of David Graham as Dr. Long, uh, a good mix of a Brains and Gordon Tracy voice. Never realised he had any involvement in Space Precinct, or was it someone else? No, Anthony, you're right. It was indeed David Graham there, a guest voice in the Forever Beetle. Jamie, do you know who... Which actor has had the most vocal appearances, as it were, throughout all of Jerry Anderson's series? David Graham must be up there. I would think Denise Bryan must be there. 
yeah, I suppose because if you include Gosh. all the audio series from Terror Hawks, yeah, then then that's probably right. Denise. Yeah, that's difficult, isn't it? I mean, Shane yeah. Shane obviously did a fair amount. Da- David yeah. must be one of the the top ranked. You'd think so, wouldn't you? Yeah, but uh, does anybody and- have a, a spreadsheet mm-hmm. with the total number of Anderson of Ander hours? I mean, I'm looking at Chris Dale. I mean, he's bound to have a spreadsheet. Okay, well, Chris, so, uh, when you've finished playing with your abacus over there, if you could put that to yeah. good use and work out yeah. the most, what would we say, the, the most vocal, the most verbose. Um. <laughs> I don't think that's quite right. But anyway, yes, we you know, know what, what you mean. I mean. Yeah, yeah, we know what you mean. Uh, Heather Ballard said, some things I learned today about Richard Harvey, composer of the Terrorhawks soundtrack. Oh, yes. Mm. Now, she says he was a member of the prog folk group Griffon. He was. He performed the woodwind solos in the soundtrack for The Lion King. Yes. I mean, this is like Fab or Fib, isn't it, for anyone who's ever watched uh, Fab Live? But also, he was the conductor when they were recording the soundtrack for Interstellar. Yes. That's extraordinary. Because Richard is is Hans Zimmer's right-hand man. Right. So he does a lot of stuff for Hans. And, yep. uh His right-hands man. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, he's here every week. Um, <sighs> yes, and when I went to the Hans Zimmer World Tour, Richard was there in the middle of the stage playing... Right a million instruments he was literally surrounded by a plethora of different instruments from uh, you know plucked strung things to woodwind instruments to percussive stuff Uh, and he was just seamlessly flipping from instrument to instrument what a clever man and we must get him on the podcast you've just just reminded me we must book him in Yes, that would be great to hear from him. Lee Homer also posted on our Facebook group just caught up with the first three episodes of First Action Bureau very impressed I can't wait to see how the story unfolds the cast was superb Guess I better wait patiently for the next instalment now. Yes, Lee, you're right. They're coming out every week now, of course, after that initial first three. So every Thursday, a brand new episode of uh, First Action Bureau. And finally, Lauren J. Gradwell. I don't have one, but if you owned an Alexa, how many would say, Alexa, change voice to Richard James? Lol. <laughs> Was that you lolling? Or... No, it says LOL here. Oh, OK. <laughs> That's from Lauren. That's Lauren lolling. Yeah. Well, of course, I know the voice of Alexa. I can't even tell you who it is, but I do know who the voice of Alexa is. Ah, uh, of course, yes. Yeah, and she's a close friend of mine, but I can't tell you, because it's, you know... Well, you just narrowed it down. It's verboten. I, well, that's true, yeah, yeah. Gosh. I'm not going to. If you're a close friend of Richard James, do mm. email is us you? podcast <laughs> at jerryanderson.co.uk. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, uh, that's all him. from our Facebook group, yeah. <laughs> do join in facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podsterons, answer a few questions and we'll let you in and join in the fun. Mmm. Yeah. We'd love that if you would. What we also love around here at James are new bits of Jerry Anderson material, especially those derived from old Jerry Anderson material. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. So it seems very fitting that this week we mm. should have the third in our series of audiobook excerpts. This week, Into Infinity Planetfall by Gregory L. Norris, read by Anderson alumnus Robbie Stevens. Jerry Anderson's Into Infinity Planetfall, a novel by Gregory L. Norris. Chapter 1. It was happening again. The Space Authority lightship Altares was coming apart after arrowing straight into the moor of the black hole. Streamers of fantastic colour lit at the direct vision space windows and portholes, bathing the interior of the ship in a kaleidoscopic effulgence. The glow from their universe chased them down into the whirlpool, it too unable to escape the singularity's hunger. At first, she'd attempted to hold their course steady. As the ship's co-pilot, it was Jane Masters' duty and a commitment she would honour to the end, if indeed this was an ending for Altares and her crew of five. It certainly looked to be. Thunder pulsed at Jane's ears and smothered her shouts to the others. One moment she was still seated in the second of the two pilot chairs facing the forward space window, the navigation controls bucking against her grip, and the violent unknown before them. Altares was a solid ship, laid out from stem to stern in the shape of a metal arrow. The next second she was evicted from her chair, and the arrow was tumbling out of control. What followed was a dance between the light ship's compartments, flight deck to navigation, and from there back and forth through the monitoring area and cruise quarters, to the dead end where the photon drive unit was housed. 
Oh, there was more to Alteres, much more beyond the core star drive that had gotten them so deep into the heart of their former galaxy and was now leading them to their deaths. Past the photon drive were the enormous tanks filled with the chemicals used to fuel the lightship's standard speed engines. Above their heads, the massive directional antenna that housed transmitters, particle scoop, and Alteres' powerful forward laser cannon designed to clear space debris from the way ahead. Below, the ship's dual wings, home to stabilizers, energy transfer units, and the hangars containing a pair of EVA support craft Jane had nicknamed kites for their whimsical design, which reminded her of a painting her late mother had created of a planet during a life untold light years at their backs. Alteres was a sturdy ship, the sturdiest, but Jane was convinced their only home was doomed to be crushed or come apart under the unholy stress being forced upon her hull. Reality blurred. For a terrifying instant, she suffered double vision. There were two Janes, and two of everyone else, Anna Bowen, their chief medical officer, two Tom Bowens, ship's navigator, two David Bowens, Tom and Anna's young son, and two Harry Masters. Jane's father, Alteres's pilot and captain of the mission, receded from her outstretched hand. She was falling farther away from him. At the porthole she spied a second Alteres, flying in formation beside them. Not only was the black hole readying to obliterate them, it was determined to duplicate their pain so that the end would be twice as agonizing. Two crews, two Alteres, she remembered thinking in that final moment how the forces inside a singularity could warp time as well as space. And she remembered thinking, there goes an alternate version of us, a parallel timeline. Then the second Alteres vanished, and the light grew blinding as the savage shaking gradually stilled. Some say that if you go through a rotating black hole, you'll end up in another universe— Anna had said after they got trapped in the singularity's gravitational pull. Or even a new dimension. We don't know. But if we do survive it, there's no way back. They had survived it, thought Jane. So why was Alteres shaking again, coming apart at the seams? Something's not right, her inner voice reasoned. Something's... Jane opened her eyes. The familiar outline of her sleeping bunk pulled free of the kaleidoscope. She was in the crew's quarters, where she'd gone to rest following the Alteres' successful emergence out of the black hole. They hadn't been crushed or shaken apart, as she'd feared. So why was the lightship trembling around her? She sat up and reached for the white jacket and boots that completed her powder blue regulation uniform ensemble. Alteres quivered. Blinking the last of the sleep from her eyes, Jane headed through the throat of the light ship's top deck, holding on to the lengths of metal safety rail as she advanced into the empty monitoring area. For a terrible moment, the thought that she alone had survived the singularity fueled her growing worry that the others had vanished onto that alternate Altares glimpsed briefly through the porthole. Then in the navigation area, the most reassuring sight greeted her, Two figures manned the navigation table, father and son, clad in fawn and chocolate uniforms with white jackets and boots. Keep her steady, skipper, said Tom Bowen. A little more's all we need. Another three hundred metres should suffice, David Bowen called above the chop. Three hundred confirmed, said Anna. She stood at the wall of computers that lined part of the navigation area. Jane shot a look toward the direct vision porthole across from the chart table, alerted by a flash of light. The kaleidoscopic deluge sucked into the black holes more with them was back. They had returned to her nightmare. Only Jane was awake. Dad? Jane called. Anna turned and spoke Jane's name. Then their doctor hastened across the navigation area and guided Jane over to the nearest vacant chair. What's happening? Jane asked. We should be there in a few seconds, Jane, Anna said. Three hundred meters down, confirmed, David barked. Initiate scans and extend the particle scoop. Alteres jolted and groaned around them. 
Her heart still in a gallop, Jane again turned toward the porthole. A fireball streaked past, the colour robust against a palette of mostly blue. Particle scoop extended, Harry Masters answered from the flight deck. Anna! This came from Bowen. Anna manoeuvred back to the wall of computers. Initiating scan. Jane stood, drawn to the porthole. Beyond the circle of reinforced glass, a stunning image spread before her eyes. Wispy clouds, blue skies above, the firmament of an alien world's surface far below. Another fireball blew past, and now she understood its source was one of the light ship's steering rockets. The Altares was cutting through atmosphere. We've got it, Harry, Anna announced. You can take her back up. Thank God for that, her father answered. All tight, folks. Ascending back into orbital pattern. The steering rockets fired again. Gravity pulled on Jane's insides. The heaviness deepened before it loosened its grip. Shadows fell over the porthole. When Jane looked again, they were high over the blue planet and once more in orbit. They gathered around the chart table. Anna passed the printout to Harry Masters, who gave it a quick scan before handing it to Bowen. David read the results. By volume, the planet's atmosphere contains 78.09% nitrogen, 20.95% oxygen, 0.93% argon, and 0.04% carbon dioxide. The rest is mostly water vapour. Which makes it a wonderful discovery, Anna said. An Earth-like planet perfectly positioned in its yellow dwarf star's circumstellar habitable zone. Brilliant, Masters said. Only that's not exactly what we took Altairis down into the atmosphere to determine. She'd wanted to chastise her father for letting her sleep. Jane was ship's co-pilot, and being in that chair beside him was more important than rest, no matter how much she needed it. But her father's expression stopped Jane from complaining. Hydrogen, she said. Masters nodded. Or a lack thereof. Like on Earth, there's an absence of hydrogen gas in this planet's atmosphere. If hydrogen molecules bounce up, travelling at an escape velocity of 11.3 kilometres per second, they leave the atmosphere and don't return, said Anna. Which leaves us with a serious problem, Bowen sighed. Masters nodded. If we don't replenish our chemical fuel supply soon, Alteres' tanks are going to run empty, and we'll be dead up here in orbit. Chapter 2 She was constructed in orbit, topside of Space Station Delta, and hadn't been designed to navigate a planet's atmosphere. Then again, David mused, Altares hadn't been envisioned to fly straight down into a rotating black hole, but on both accounts the light ship had outperformed expectations. The blue planet rolled far beneath them, its cracked terrain, water bodies and crimson-tinged impact craters visible beyond the navigation area's porthole. The view distracted him from his work. Following their brazen plunge down into the new planet's stratosphere in search of hydrogen gas, the second shipwide diagnostic in as many days was underway. Altares had fared well following her arrival to this reality, suffering only minor damage, all things considered. Her charge through the planet's upper atmosphere had resulted in even less thus far, according to their central computer, a power fluctuation in subcompartment D. Harry Masters exited the flight deck. Anything else, David? David turned from the stunning panorama of the blue planet beneath constellations of crystal facet silver stars, the latter all floating among plumes of gauzy purple gas. So far, Captain, it's just the forward laser cannon and that nagging energy drain in subcompartment D. The rest of Altares is running like she was still docked atop Space Station Delta. Master smiled. Good work. Tom? Bowen glanced up from the chart table. Skipper, apart from an asteroid field that could be planetary remains or debris ejected out of the singularity, that shiny blue sphere beneath us is the only world in this system. No convenient gas giants out there for us to pop in and refuel at, I'm afraid. The smile dropped from Masters' face. 
Damn. Don't write us off just yet, Bowen continued. He waved Masters over to the chart table, whose view screen displayed the singularity at their backs. On this side of space, the singularity was a white hole, an exit point whose event horizon was marked by the particles of light being swallowed down the black hole's throat. Bowen adjusted the picture. New coordinates turned the light ship's external cameras two degrees toward the purple gas clouds that magnified the silver light cast from the nearest stars. I believe we've found the closest refueling depot, Bowen said. The chart table's gauges tracked the distance. A sizable gulf separated them from the closest plume. That means, Masters started, I know, activating the photon drive before we've had the chance to do a complete systems evaluation. For all we know, the same problem that got us here could repeat. But as I see it, we don't have much of a choice. Masters nodded. When do we depart? I'd suggest in twelve hours, Skipper. Time enough for us to get that forward laser cannon repaired and resolve whatever's going on down there in the lower deck. Masters rested both hands on David's shoulders. And for some of us to get rested. I'm not tired, David said, which wasn't exactly the truth. No doubt, but I'd like the entire crew alert, and you're already two hours past your scheduled break. David looked at his father, who, despite his smile, tipped his chin in the direction of the crew's quarters. You heard our captain. Besides, the exploration of the planet's been postponed for now. Go on. David headed toward the arch between compartments. There he turned back. We are going down there, aren't we? Masters nodded. Once Altares is full up, you just try to stop us making planet fall and taking a look around. David smiled. Good night. Masters flashed the boy a thumbs up. Good night, son, his father said. They hadn't brought much aboard with them, one hold all each. David's had contained several new decks of playing cards, though he had yet to open one. Mostly, he brought books with him. Despite the lightship's reference library containing more truths and fictions than could possibly be read over the course of an entire lifetime, he preferred physical, printed volumes. From beneath his pillow, David drew out the battered, paperback copy of Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. He was only a few pages into Part One, The Old Buccaneer. Jim Hawkins, Trelawney, and Dr. Livesey had yet to board the Hispaniola in search of Captain Flint's buried treasure. He'd read the book twice before, the first time during their training for the Altares mission. Still, how he loved his fictional predecessor's adventure and lost himself in the words until, a few pages later, sleep claimed him. Masters opened the locker, which contained five Atmo suits and an equal number of helmets. Two of the suits were pale blue, the remaining three two-tone, fawn and chocolate. He had no trouble identifying which Atmo suit was his. While I'm out there, Masters said, Anna lifted the helmet, I'll try to resolve that power fluctuation down here. Masters stepped into the Atmo suit and secured magnetic seals, he took the helmet from Anna and donned it, then secured the final lock. Once the suit's sensors detected everything was in place, the suit activated. Masters tapped the helmet's radio. The horn activated, patching him into the ship's intercom. Jane, hold her steady. Yes, Captain, Jane answered. Anna signalled he was set to go with a thumbs up, and Masters approached the hatch, marked one. The airlock, a perfect circle, split into quarters and opened when he stabbed the door controls. The dark landscape beyond lit. He plodded from Altares into the kite's passenger section, a moulded bench for four set beneath space windows and a storage compartment for transporting equipment. Masters turned back. Anna handed him the repair kit and then the requisitioned replacement parts from storage. Masters secured the gear. Good luck, Harry, Anna said. He nodded and closed the airlock. Anna backed away and faced the direction of subcompartment D. Masters took the pilot's chair. After so much time in Altares's cockpit, the kite's controls were a tight fit. 
He ignored his discomfort, did his best to forget that every second up here put them closer to running out of the chemical fuel that fed the ship's conventional engines and steering rockets, and completed his checklist. Opening things up, Alteres, he spoke into the horn. Roger that, Kite One, Jane answered. Masters thumbed the button that rolled back the starboard hangar door. Light from the day face of the blue planet below flooded the kite. In sequence, he started her up. The kite also ran on the chemical mix and would be good to go for his needs. Magnetics disengaged. He gripped the steering column, nudged her down and out of the hangar, and exited beneath the Alteres's starboard wing. The majesty of his surroundings struck Masters in a way he hadn't known standing aboard the lightship, which was vaster in scope and less open to the surrounding universe. The blue planet appeared full and beautiful before the kite's forward space window, as did those vibrant crystal stars in the distance. Even more breathtaking was Alteris herself, after he boosted the kite up past her starboard wing and toward her topside, passing the lightship superstructure of hull armor, fuel tanks, and those few direct vision ports beyond which the crew worked in service of the mission. Higher, Parallel to the directional antenna that housed the forward laser cannon, he was reminded of the vessel's majesty, from the forward prow of her command module all the way back to the photon drive unit's propulsion vent. Altares was beautiful. The lightship had travelled far from her planet of origin. Her crew had accomplished their original mission to reach Alpha Centauri and launch the network of long-range communication satellites that would assist in future manned missions beyond Earth's solar system. They'd survived the malfunction in the photon drive caused by the capture of a superluminal particle that got scooped up and knocked around in the system, travelled an unknown number of light years off course, and navigated through the black hole. The light ship looked great, considering the demands that had been made of her. The first known planet exhibiting similar traits to Mother Earth rolled beneath them. Yes, by all reckoning, the Altaires' mission had exceeded the original goals many times over. Masters nudged the kite closer to the antenna, extended the magnetic arm, and fixed the smaller ship in position. He cycled decompression, opened the hatch, and clamped his safety line secure. Then Harry Masters stepped out of the kite, the first human being to set foot in this new, mysterious universe. Chapter 3 Absent was the usual background noise Anna associated with their life one deck above her present location on Altares. The constant hum and sweep of scanners, the ping-pong melody of the electronic eyes keeping watch on surrounding space for incoming dangers, was replaced by a singular thrum that Anna's imagination translated into a giant's heartbeat. She supposed it was, the lightships, on the slow amble down the barely-lit corridor to the hatch leading into subcompartment D, her memory called up the ship's schematics. Arteries and the ship's metal skeleton converged here, near the core of Alteris's power systems, which made the analogy of a pulse believable. She'd been down here three times before, first during the official tour, while the lightship was still anchored to Delta Station in orbit around the Earth, the second came after the last of their shakedown cruises through Earth's solar system, which had targeted Neptune, during which the particle scoop had replenished the chemical fuel tanks through an atmospheric dive much like the manoeuvre they would soon attempt in the stellar gas plumes. Following Neptune, a power relay in the air purification system had stuck while the ship was still in the gas giant's outer layers performing the emergency refuelling manoeuvre. She'd corrected the malfunction. And how Delta Station's commander, Jim Forbes, had praised her heroics. Anna halted her advance and reached to the wall for support. She gripped the metal safety rail running up to the hatch leading into D. Maybe we should make you captain of the mission, Forbes said in her thoughts. Anna closed her eyes, aware that breathing had become difficult. Jim Forbes materialized in her memory. 
For long days and across light years, an entire universe, in fact, she'd kept thoughts of him banished behind mental revetments. How his crisp white commander's uniform with its black collar and stripes along both arms fit his physique in a way that should have been criminal. The scent of his skin, clean male sweat mixed with the brand of soap he used. How she'd almost opted to stay behind on Delta after their brief connection. In the end, Anna chose David and her marriage to Tom over a life with Forbes. For the first time since Altares emerged from the black hole, it struck her that Forbes was gone, long dead, according to Einstein's time dilation theory. Time on Earth passed at a faster advance than their life lived on the light ship. And who knew how linear time had been affected during their crossing over to this new universe upon leaving their old? Forbes, Space Station Delta, maybe even the very planet of their origin, were gone, Tears stung at the corners of her eyes. Anna fought them, but failed. The first few slipped down her cheeks. Beyond the watery veil, ghosts from the past manifested. Forbes, along with that previous Anna Bowen. You performed admirably, he said, a blurry white phantom with black lines cutting through. Only because of your training, the ghost dressed in fawn and chocolate answered, You're being modest. I have half a mind to reassign you to Delta, keep you here, and all to myself. Silence followed that declaration, which was innocent enough on the surface, but on that day, lost to the past, breathing hadn't been any easier, and the pressure in the air seemed to double at the bottommost point on Altares. Commander, Jim, please, it's just you and me now, Anna. One ghost reached for the other. Anna closed her eyes in the present, stemming further tears. What had followed, Forbes reaching for her hand, the breathless pull before their kiss, the thrum of Altares's heart and the gallop of hers in counterpoint, continued, broadcast onto the insides of her eyelids. Anna shook her head and wiped her eyes. After reaching Alpha Centauri and deploying the satellite chain, A message beamed from Earth contained his congratulations for having fulfilled their mission. It was the last time she heard his voice, and the sense of what she lost had pursued her deeper into the galaxy like an unwanted second shadow. How much distance needed to pass before she was fully over Jim Forbes? The horn resting on her right ear chirped, shocking her back to the moment. Anna sucked in a deep, cleansing breath before reaching up to tap the activation button, opening the channel to the top deck. "'How are things down there?' her husband asked. Apart from the ghosts that had faded back into the ether, Anna was alone. Even so, she forced herself to smile. "'Just getting my bearings, Tom.' Bowen chuckled over the intercom, and how that sound reassured her. I thought you knew every metre of this ship intimately. Some sections more intimately than others, she thought, resuming her approach to subcompartment D's hatch. Just checking in to make sure that you're all right, sweetheart. Her smile persisted, no longer forced. Thanks for being there. Always. Navigation area out. The horn chirped again, and then went silent. If memories of Jim Forbes were unwelcome, she was happy for this reminder that she'd made the proper decision. Anna jabbed her code into the keypad. The round airlock, identical to others around the ship, uncoupled into four pie wedges that drew back into the surrounding bulkhead. The area beyond sat in a darkness broken only by the barest flicker of power diodes. She activated the light controls. Overhead switched on in sequence, throwing the familiar white glow across a long, narrow corridor with power conduit running the length of one wall, with the junction, her destination, housed at the other. She ducked through the hatch and moved into subcompartment D. Forbes was gone. So was everything else that mattered, save what mattered most. David and Tom were directly above, and Altares was damaged and running low on fuel. She exorcised Jim Forbes from her focus and headed down the corridor.
Instantly, a frisson of disquiet struck her, halting Anna several metres in. Tom had been correct in his statement about her knowledge of the lightship's layout from top to bottom, stem to stern. This was not the same sub-compartment D she traversed following the Neptune manoeuvre. The junction was where she expected, and the light glimmered over the access terminal, which jibed with the diagnosis of a power fluctuation. A minor sting, considering all the lightship could have suffered between Earth and high orbit above the blue planet. Even so, a minor injury that needed tending. The toolkit hanging from a strap at her shoulder grew heavy as her confusion worsened. No, the discrepancy was real, and located past the junction and a section of bulkhead running smoothly toward the aft of the compartment. That area of solid wall had been designated as overflow storage during the shakedown cruise to Neptune, an entire room of open space. She knew this to be a fact, because that's where Forbes took her for their kiss. Anna's gaze fixed on the solid length of wall, featureless apart from the same likeness to other metal cladding used throughout the rest of Altares. On the other side was a room, she was sure of it. The exorcism hadn't been a success, Forbes was back, and she was with him. "'Do you know where we're standing?' he asked. That past version of Anna glanced around at the power conduit and featureless walls of the box-shaped empty compartment. "'Overflow storage? The future,' Forbes said. Then all emotion ironed off his handsome face. At the time, she'd assumed he was speaking about the greater scope of things, the future— Altares. While the Earth Authority struggled to fix the situation below, the Space Authority was constructing giant new stations in high orbit and readying to launch manned missions far beyond Sol. Her own future had seemed clear following Neptune. Soon, she'd depart aboard Altares for Alpha Centauri. But the way ahead wasn't so certain following what happened next, when he took her hand, kissed it, and then crushed his mouth over hers. No tears born of regret came this time. Anna's focus remained on the inconsistency, solid bulkhead where a room had existed. She blinked herself out of the trance and hastened back to the junction. Anna relaxed her shoulder and set to work opening the panel. The light continued to tick on and off, signalling the problem. She traced the fluctuation to a power feed coupling. One of the lines had overloaded and tripped, putting the burden completely on its partner. An easy fix. She keyed in the sequence to redistribute evenly, flipped the unit back onto active, and the ticking light stabilised into a solid green. Problem solved, thought Anna. Unexpected movement teased the corner of her eye. She tensed, turned, and standing before her in the corridor of subcompartment D was Jim Forbes, he was dressed in his crisp white Delta Station uniform, with its black collar and sleeve stripes. Jim? Anna gasped. Forbes smiled. This is all about second chances, he said. Anna froze. Forbes, here? Impossible. And as soon as that thought was made, the guards listened, and Jim Forbes vanished. Ooh, well, if you want to know Ooh. what happens next, you'll have to yeah. go to bigfinish.com and get the book. Or if you don't want to do it through the Big Finish app or you don't have a bigfinish.com account, you can get it through the Jerry Anderson store, shop.jerryanderson.co.uk. Now, as Sue Cowley at Big Finish said when she listened through to this, she emailed me yeah. and said, no, you can't leave it there. What happens next? So uh-huh. uh, you can be assured that this does end on sort of a cliffhanger. Okay. Uh, which leaves things open for maybe future adventures for the crew of the Altaires. Right. You'll just have to read and find out where they could possibly go next. How interesting. Now, this is from the uh, the novel that was out um, last year, I think. Is that right? Yes. I'm interested in it. If people... Are, I, I don't know. I think I... If I had the novel, I think I would even like the audio version. Is, is that a strange thing or is that just me? You would like the audio version as in you would enjoy it as an addition. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I, I mean... It's funny, it, isn't it? It's got some musical bits and pieces in there which just add to the whole atmosphere. And I think it's a different experience passively enjoying 
or an audiobook versus actively reading it, isn't it? Yes, true. So I think you might yes. get something new. And uh, and Robbie is an accomplished audiobook reader. Oh yeah. Cool. So you'll definitely get something different from his performance alone. I think. Yeah. So, great. There you go. Lovely. Yeah. So uh, now you're listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. We're here for a little bit longer because I've got some more messages to read out and we'll be hearing from Chris Dale and his amazing randomizer a bit later on. Don't forget you can subscribe to us on whichever platform you're listening to us on. You can leave us a nice revating, tell us what you think of the podcast and even share us with your friends so they get to hear us too. And don't forget, just for now, you can send us your 10 word reviews, pop them on Twitter and hashtag us Jerry Anderson podcast. Or if you're not on social media, and I know many of you aren't, you can just email it into podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and um, we'll pick a couple to uh, read out next time meanwhile over on Twitter people have been hashtagging us Peter Dernan for example has listened to the first uh, Action Bureau and he says wow having found that there's first Action Bureau merchy merch 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 available already how fab is there? yes well there are there, there are t-shirts and a, a mug and also the special collector's edition CD set is available for pre-order which will be available in December Oh, nice. But uh, it is a limited edition. I actually can't recall how many currently. Right. Uh, okay. So do pop along and pre-order that if you'd like it. And it'll be a 90-minute feature edit of the story. Great. So not the individual 10-minute yeah. episodes, but uh, straight through as if you are uh, listening to an audio movie like it john hammond tweeted uh, he's just listened to another great and fun episode of the jerry anderson podcast always a pleasure to listen to jamie richard and chris and his wonderful randomizer segment always look forward to what's next well so do we john and chris dale himself took to twitter to say thrilled by the huge overwhelming reaction to the second action department trailer before the <laughs> randomizer on the past uh, week's jerry anderson podcast and how brilliant everyone says it is literally everyone i asked everybody he says you should probably hire me right right now while you still can yes chris absolutely right yeah uh, we all enjoyed that max ingram says uh i'm not much into audio dramas this is uh, on the news of the release of space precinct revisited for new audio adventures for the officers of precinct 88 he says but i would love to see more space precinct adventures from you in book format i absolutely loved your demeter city novel well max it's very nice to hear i think space precinct revisited is due a release as paperback and it will e-book. be out in a couple of months yes and i I don't think it's much of an exclusive to say that there will probably be, am I allowed to say this? Yes, go More on. More future adventures for the officers of Precinct 88 coming next year. So, yes, you're you entirely accurate in that statement. Great. And finally, uh, J- Shirley Burton said, my treadmill workout this morning got more exciting while listening to the first three episodes of <laughs> First Action Bureau. Really intense and I can't wait for the next one. This is following on from last week when I asked, where are the strange places that you've been listening to First Action Bureau? Well, Shirley Burton's been listening on her treadmill. That is a great place to listen. Isn't it? I can yeah. imagine that would really get the heart racing, wouldn't it? Both, both the treadmill and listening to First Action Bureau. Well, you're totally right. But Richard, mm. you mentioned you're getting your heart racing. I'm very pleased to say we've had another <gasps> entry into this 10 word oh. uh, thing. Right. Okay. And this one reads, yep. was Richard James in Space Precinct? He never mentions it. Oh, right. I didn't realise yes. you could send emails to yourself, but <laughs> uh, there we go. <laughs> Ah, very good. Then we look forward to your genuine ten word entries as soon as you can possibly send them in. Make yes. sure you tag us on Twitter or put them to uh, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. They can be jokey if you like, but we really love some genuine ones as well. That would yeah. be great. Yeah. Richard James. Mm, Jamie Anderson. Christopher Dale. Ah, oh, yes. Of the family Dale. Yeah. Um, with his abacus. With his abacus in the corner We're there. Counting on you, Chris. Yeah, he's now working out who's been the, the most uh, uh, regularly yeah. occurring voice in the, uh, the world of Anderson. But That's right. Until he finishes that, we can probably just uh, sustain ourselves with a bit, a bit of his marvellous randomizer. Oh, I think you're probably right. And I believe this week he has a special guest. <gasps> Over to you, Chris. So you've definitely got a fix on that now, yeah? Okay, and we're not, we're not too far? Okay, good. Oh, hello everyone. Uh, Sorry, no time to chat today. You see, we've picked up a distress call from a nearby spacecraft, so we're just moving in now to investigate. In fact, I think we may now be close enough to make contact. We are? Yep. Okay, well, let's give it a try. This is Eagle 13 calling Vessel in Distress. Please identify yourself. Unidentified Vessel, this is Eagle 13. Do you read me? (laughs) 
hello. Uh, can we help you at all? Do you need medical attention? I don't think so. Well, would it help if we got a little closer? Yes, that would have been perfect. Okay, stand by. Um, yeah, get us a bit closer, Marina, and I'll prepare the boarding tube. That would have been necessary. Scrub, but is a youngster, and I am your prisoner. Do you maybe want to try that again? Yes, hold on. You are my prisoners. Right. And I am a youngster. Of course. And I will release you if you were greedy to my demands. Which are? Um, I want to push the button, please. You what? Don't you remember? You came to Mars a while ago looking for someone to push the button on the randomizer. Yes, I do remember that. I really, really wanted to do it. Mother's forbidden me to press any more big red buttons, you see, after, well, what happened last time. Only that horrid little it star beat me to it. But, young star, that was Pod 97. That was months ago. I know. I've been following you ever since. And we have actually been back to Mars since then. Well... I did get a bit lost a few times. I see. Then I ran out of fuel. Oh, God. And food. So basically you've... Been drifting in space for about three months, actually. <laughs> well, there, there, young star. It's all right. We'll look after you. Ah. <laughs> And yes, yes, of course, you're more than welcome to make today's randomizer selection. Oh, good. This button here, isn't it? Uh, no, 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 that's the self-destruct button. Oh. Uh, I'm the only one who gets to touch that. No, no, here's the randomizer, and there's the button. So off you go. Make it a good one. Now oh. oh, that's it. Well done. Hooray! And obviously, we'll gladly give you a lift home too. Oh, thank you. I expect Mummy will be wondering where I've got to. Oh, she's noticed you're missing. Uh -oh. mm, she just doesn't care. Oh, I'm used to that. Did I do it right? Well, see for yourself. The printout's right there if you'd like to tell us what we're watching today. Uh, uh, yeah, this side, young star. Oh. This side. Yes. That's... So, today's episode is from... Uh, Terror Hawks. Oh, I know that show. And the episode is called Midnight Blue. Oh, oh, oh. Don't think I remember that one. Am I in it? Oh, no, you are in it. In fact, at the very end, you are instrumental oh. in thwarting your mother's latest evil plan. Oh, 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 no. Not one of those episodes. Um, oh, can I have another go? Ah, no, sorry, I'm afraid it is one go per person, and we do have to watch whatever gets picked. Oh, well... <laughs> Does it come with snacks? Oh, I don't think we, uh... Oh, Marina, that, uh, that bucket of carbon deposits you scraped off our engine baffles this morning. Do you still have it? Oh, thank you, Marina. Oh, it's still warm. Yes. In fact, young star, if you're going to be sticking around for a while, maybe you'd like to sit in on this one, you know, uh, talk about your memories of making this episode. <coughs> or, or, or maybe not. Well then, here's a uh, midnight blue. Pardon you. So while Youngstar gets on with his bucket of carbon goo, we'll get on and watch this week's episode on the randomizer, Midnight Blue, which is an episode that uh, I find is is one of those episodes. I think in every show, every Anderson series, you have an episode where. You just you keep forgetting that this one even exists, and in fact, uh, many years ago, some of you may have seen the. Uh... Oh, we are opening with with Young Star eating a bucket of of goo. Uh... That's bringing us full circle. I think Pluto's hungry. 
Harry. Oh, Pluto. What? He is hungry. I really liked this um, this uh, running subplot with Pluto. Well, not it wasn't really a subplot. It was a, a my granite crunchy. A sub sub subplot of uh, Sistar's little pet cube, Pluto. For two reasons, partly because I, I think it hints at um, this this uh, maternal instinct that would later be fulfilled in uh, Can't hear anything. in the second series, but also it's nice to give the cubes who are a, a very minor part of the show a, a bit more focus. Well, of course I can. I'm also pretty sure it's Windsor Davies doing the voice, but uh, I don't think that's ever been confirmed. Anyway, there's a Zeef diving for Zelda's complex. It's going to crash. Oh, here it comes, straight in, and... What happened, young star? I don't know. Where's the kaboom? It is a zeef, but where is it? Much closer than you imagine. Stand clear, so it may land. Oh, Zelda's got to... Uh, even for Zelda, that's some uh, serious bed hair on her this morning. And be amazed! As we open the doors to the Martian atmosphere. Oh yeah, and a miniature Zeef is uh, entering the room. And here we get an absolutely adorable shot of young Star's feet oh, plodding up to the Zeef, which uh, doesn't even come up to his, his knees. I can see no reason to miniaturize a Zeef. And this um, this kind of brings up a question that uh, is uh, a sort of running, running, nagging question in my mind throughout Terror Hawks. In episodes like this, who is piloting the Zeefs? Sorry, Zelda. I don't think it can be Cube, so that means that it's got to be someone like Perfect in every detail. Sram or Lord Tempo sat in there, miniaturized with comes planet there. with nothing to do. It, it, the Zeefs need a pilot. And panic the So I've I've never quite understood who who pilots them. It will terrorize the Terror Hawks precisely. Oh. And there goes the wig. Why does that always happen? And I suppose this is the uh, another throwback to uh, the Super Marionation era of Anderson shows of uh, the shrinking episode. And although um, none of the uh, Terrorhawks characters actually find themselves shrunk, what? Although I think they did in, in one of the annuals. I think Hero did. Greenfly, the common aphis. Again, you can see that thinking of, oh, we've got this model that, when placed next to the puppets, looks quite small. Maybe we can do something with that. So I, w I wonder if, um, I don't know, Tony Barwick visited the studio and then got the idea for the uh, this story from that. Anyway, here comes the Zeef. We have a contact. It's a Zeef. Lock onto target. Ready to fire. Fire! Well, the charge is detonated, but... We missed... How the blazes did he miss it? It's a Zeef, Dr. Knight. Oh, that's, a, that's a, an odd um, angle on Battlehawk there. Usually we zoom in from, from Battlehawk's right-hand side. Today we were on the left. I'm wondering if that was just a flock shot. This is a 1050. Because I've seen pictures of the, uh, the model stage, and um, in none of those pictures have I seen the left-hand side of the set being open for the camera. It's always been the right. Anyway, enough of Battlehawk. Hawkwing's off to uh, investigate this uh, Zeef that's gone missing. We've got the intruder on positive track. And going back to something that I uh, I mentioned at the beginning uh, about sure do. the forgettable nature of uh, certain mid-season Anderson episodes, um, through no fault of their own, largely it's just uh, altitude one oh. It's just if there's an episode like this with nothing really to distinguish itself, you can operational limit, and you can forget about them every so often. And in fact, when I was putting together my, um, you may have seen it on on YouTube, my YouTube channel, uh, every single Anderson episode ever made a montage. It runs for about 15 minutes. The first edit I made of this, I missed off two episodes and one of those was Midnight Blue uh, and the other one was uh, Captain Scarlet Treble Cross Kate break off pursuit the tiger we're so close which is also one I, I, I tend to forget about anyway I think I see it 
Okay, Kate and Hawkeye are going very, very high. No, I'm giving you an order. But if they go much higher... Yeah, I hear you. They're going to go into space, so it's time to call off. Ooh. Facing to the wind. Oh. I feel a restless kind of motion. And I believe this is the first appearance in the series of uh, Kate's signature hit. Uh, just an episode or two before it would actually... Uh, would have a whole story revolving around it. SOS, or SOS Mr. Tracy. This is a slightly earlier demo version of it, which doesn't quite have the same kick as the, uh, the later single release. I hate the shot of Hawkwing swooping over the White House, by the way. Yeah, this doesn't have the same beef as the, the later, later version that appears in Play Against Ram. Anyway, Tiger's here to completely kill the mood. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, don't stop on my account. Uh, I enjoy fun, too. Uh, I guess I'll uh, hit the sack. Now Hawkeye's wearing a shirt made out of a picnic blanket. Take it easy, Kate. Tiger? But even he knows not to stick around because uh, there's a little bit of uh, unsaid business needs to be dealt with between Kate and Tiger. We need to talk. All right. We could have nailed that Zeef if you hadn't pulled us back. If you'd taken Hawkwing any higher, you could have gone into Earth orbit. You could have been marooned out there. Our job is to defend the Earth. Don't tell me what our job is. All right, I'm sorry. What happened to the Zeef? We tracked it down. It landed. New York. But the Pentagon insists no alien craft flew into their airspace. So what happened? Unless our whole tracking system has gone haywire, somehow it did land in New York. I like this establishing shot of New York, this sort of generic city that uh, I think again appears in Play It Again SRAM. But I also like that scene because as we covered reasonably recently on the randomizer with, with Close Call, here's Bernie the Drunk staggering out of a bar in New York, um, one of my sort of bugbears about the early episodes of Terror Hawks was the, the the sort of serious nature of it didn't really gel with the cartoony look of the puppets. There's that sort of oh, you, Mark Darrell is a security risk. Oh, he's he's you know there's more than security. Blah 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 blah. And these puppets can't, can't quite handle those serious rise once more th those more serious ideas in, in Captain Scarlet it would work fine because the puppet the puppets uh, Confound. just look correct to have those kinds of conversations but not in Terror Hawks Please, sister. so that scene between Tiger and Kate was uh, bordering on again being something similar a bit too serious but I think they just about got away with it I think there's enough silliness in the series by this point that a very occasional moment like that works much much more successfully <laughs> and it's also vitally important to uh, to set up the second half of the story this is zero oh I love this commander of the terror hawks send in the cover <laughs> like to award me another medal for bravery, Your Majesty. You're far too kind. Perhaps <laughs> Corporal Einstein should get some token of recognition. Oh, dear. Zero? Oh! What are you playing at? Well, uh, I, I, I was only... Again, I, as I've said hundreds of times before, uh, not just on the randomizer, I adore Windsor Davies as Zero, and I, I especially love... You must have a patchy blood the way you do creep about. One or two moments like that where Zero thinks nobody is watching him and he's making a little speech... A computer... ...about his own bravery or whatever. Zero, you don't even know that two and two make five. Of course I do, sir. Definitely. You just proved my point. But, sir! Don't argue, Zero. We leave for Spacehawk immediately. So we need a Zeroid of mathematical excellence. Zero just clearly doesn't qualify. Oh, so we're taking uh, Diz Wheat and 5 5 along. Um, just, to, just to be safe, we've uh, got a choice of two there. Three and 5 5 is pretty quick at arithmetic. And his wheat has a moustache, so it all balances out. Your visit is an unexpected pleasure, Dr. Einstein. Thanks, hero. 
I brought a Xeroid computer expert with me. I'm pretty quick at arithmetic. Oh! Oh, sorry, I thought that was a different episode. Target profile, range, and tracking systems. In fact, I'm not sure it isn't. I think he says that in, in To Catch a Tiger as well. That was the episode I was thinking of. When it becomes fact, I'll tell you about it. So, Five Five is the mathematics expert, and, uh, Dee's Wheat is just here because he's... Him on the parade ground. Because he's Zero's BFF, I suppose. Hey, you're a bit of a bright spark, Dick Hewitt. What's two and two? Vingt-deux, of course. <laughs> Vingt-deux. Two and two is twenty-two. You airy fate. You're as thick as an oversized ball bearing. And one of the benefits of a Terrorhawks episode with, uh, to be fair, not a whole lot going on, at least not so far, is um, if you need moments of padding, the Xeroids are... What day is it? Are, ...are just brilliant creations to go for for that. Just throw two of them or three of them together and let them have a, a conversation. That's all you really need. Anyway, oh, Bernie the Drunk has seen the uh, Zeef model taking off. Still miniaturized in a pile of bins outside the bar. What will they think of next? Never had toys like that when I was a kid. <laughs> oh. Tiger? What is it, Mary? It's that Zeef. I've launched Hawkwing. This time we don't miss. The Zeef's heading for space, Doctor. Yeah, but Hawkwing's closing fast. Was this the entirety of Zelda's plan, just to lure Hawkwing into space? But why don't we see it? It seems, it just seems to me like the idea of a miniaturized Zeef, if she really wanted to cause some damage. Wait a minute. She could do so much more than she's doing at the moment, which is basically nothing. What if it's, say, ten times smaller? That's why it could land in New York and not be spotted. It's ten, maybe a hundred times smaller. Kate, that Zeef's been miniaturized. You'll need to get real close to make visual contact. Ten, ten. And considering that miniaturization thing was a part of Zelda's it's dangerously near to arsenal of powers, right from the very first episode, it is surprising that they abandoned pursuit. Very rarely. What do you say, partner? Made use of it. I think this. Sitter, let's go get the critter. And there's a mention of it in a later episode. Finish the job. That's about it. Have visual contact. Take it out, Hawkeye. Aye aye. Oh, and they got it. But also it got them. Bit of debris flying around. Which has damaged the engines. Which again doesn't make much sense. You would think if it was smaller, Hawkwing would be at uh, less less Enter space. risk of damage from it, but uh, into orbit. I don't know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna second guess any of Zelda's plans here. Ah my plan has worked. It's worked. Her, her, one of her weakest plans has actually uh, succeeded for once. Zelda? Something that even a gurgling idiot like Young Star could shoot down. Oh, goody, goody, goody. Okay. They've got a limited air supply and a hull that might break up any second. Zero, get some of your men out there, fast. So. Sure. This is a lovely image, though, of, of Hawkwing just drifting around the Earth in orbit, as well as... Uh, Hawkeye, try the cannon. Kate, the image of Kate and Hawkeye just completely helpless in the cabin. It's some very nice Richard Harvey incidental music for this one. It's jammed. Which, sadly, as far as I know, is, is one of the scores that doesn't survive. Do is sit tight. Here come the Xeroids. Five of them. Kate, Hawkeye, don't transmit any further. Conserve your oxygen. Help I'm is on it. Fed up with you. I don't want to hear any more from you. Tiger, Hawkwing, out. Oh, this is familiar. That's the hull. From uh, certain Stingray episodes where Stingray went. Uh, they don't have a chance. Too far beneath the. Uh, We're almost there, sir. Right. Attach yourself the surface of the water, I think um, the pr it was the pressure. Yeah, that was it. Pressure of extreme depths in episodes like The Big Gun. Stingray's hull would start creaking. Another Zeef. Flaming thunderbolts. Oh, no. 
If only we had more than one fighter craft. <laughs> Can you hear me, mother? And here he is. Youngstar, it's your big moment. Can you half? No? Okay. You have a defenseless, powerless target. I doubt if even you can miss. <laughs> Why won't miss, mother? Oh dear. Rely on me. Why am I deeply concerned whenever he says that? That's one of my favourite exchanges in the whole series. I, I love it when Young Star's got something that is so... Take it out. Tense so within his capabilities and yet he gets, he gets undone. Through no fault of his own. In this case, it's the uh, Zeroids are no match for Azif. The Zeroids who are coming up to meet him. Listen carefully. Need some lovely music here. I, I really wish this score could be found. I got it, lads. Form a battle line. So we've got a, a five Zeroids making a sort of cross shape with zero in the middle. We've wait for my command, lads. If the Zeef opens fire, they'll be blown to pieces. What's that? Navigation lights. Oh no, it's the Zeroids. Ready? No! no! Oh, poor young star. It's an enormous star cruiser! What is the cracking talking about? Star Cruiser was never made into a series. It was only in the pages of Lookin! Oh. That's it, Young Star's given up. Open fire! So who have we got here on Zero's team? We've got, obviously, Zero. 2-2, two, two, don't know him. Dee's Wheat, of course we know him. 5-5. Five, five. Oh, um, that, that, that leaves us a fifth one we need to, uh, to account for. Do we get to see who that is? Incompetent, slobbering idiot! Oh. It's not his fault. And that's it, Young Star spinning off into space. Zero Considering Hero said the Zeroids were no match for Azif, they've done quite well there. Bring her in. Oh, that's it, Zero and his men have attached themselves to Hawkwing. Gonna bring her back. Well, I guess they're, they're bringing her back into uh, the White House. It was all a question of size. I don't know how the, the Zeroids stand up to um, we assume to the heat of re-entry, but there we go. Four got the range wrong. You was right, sir. You about size. What are you talking about, Zero? Size, sir. And here we go, another another really nice uh, Zero is stupid ending uh, from Windsor Davies here. And intelligent and... Good at arithmetic. Uh, what's two and two? Two and two. Um, twenty-two. Uh, no. That's what uh, Dick Hewitt said. Um, now you've embarrassed me. Let's see now, two and two and here and It's a trick question. We cannot all be Albert Einstein. Oh, I sometimes think that the uh, the last pages in the a Terror Hawk script is just like two or three pages marked with the words Windsor Davies does something funny, and uh, if they didn't need, it didn't need to tell him anymore. He could just fill in the gaps. Anyway, that was Midnight Blue, which. Um it is one of the more forgettable episodes of the show, I find. It's there's an it's a nice image, certainly, of, of hawk wings stuck in space and orbiting the Earth. And uh, as I said a few times, the the musical score there for that one is really nice. But other than that, it's like it's a really nice idea to miniaturize the Zeef. You know, who knows the the kind of chaos that uh, that Zelda could cause with that? And it's like, well, she sends it to New York, and then she calls it back. Yeah, the plan was just to get Hawkwing all along, which is is fine in itself. I just feel like the the idea of the shrunken Zeef uh, maybe could have been saved for a, a slightly better story than this one. So, um, with with thanks to Young Star there for for making the selection for us, but uh, not one of my favourite episodes of Terror Hawks. Let's see how he's doing. It could be a while. Oh, Ooh, goody, good. goody, goody. <laughs> a special guest, Robbie yes. Stevens. Great. Yeah, very nice. The artist formerly known as Ben Stevens. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, remember that. Oh, isn't that nice? Chris goes to so much effort on these uh, randomizers. It's brilliant. But lovely well, to have Robbie special guest yeah, in there. Absolutely. Yeah, that's why people love it so much. Randomizer is always very popular. Yeah, Robbie Stevens, he's a great Anderson voice, isn't it? It's such a rich 
sort of uh, history of uh, people like David Graham, Denise Breyer, Robbie Stevens, it's just some fantastic voice actors over the years. Mm. Great to be using them even now. Yes, absolutely. Even in their dotage. I'm only joking, <laughs> uh, Robbie Stevens. Obviously, Robbie is still Careful. only 24 years old. Yes. Uh, <laughs> No, that's great. Chris, nice job. And maybe Robbie can make some returns. I mean, he played so many characters in the worlds of Anderson. Uh, yeah. We could have uh, Captain Blue, a new Captain mm. Scarlet. Um, yeah. We could have Dizweet or Hudson from yeah. uh, Terrorhawks. Oh, uh, probably some other ones too. Maybe yeah. he could crack out some of his big Finnish voices. I mean, yeah, why not? Maybe, Richard, one day Chris mm-hmm. may have uh, Richard James as a guest oh, on The Randomizer. Think? Oh, I mean, that would be... I could retire then. I could retire happy. Yeah, OK, Chris, don't book him because we need to keep him for the main podcast. So. <laughs> OK, Chris will be back next week with, would you believe it, another randomizer where he'll choose another random episode of a random Jerry Anderson series and randomly watch it randomly. Great. And in the meantime, of course, you can catch up with them on the Jerry Anderson uh, podcast, randomizer podcast, app, <laughs> podcast... <laughs> Uh, if you, you want to listen to the you randomizer, can subscribe to his yes in isolation. Right. You can subscribe yeah. to the Jerry Anson Randomizer podcast. Yeah, exactly. That's but that's what I said. You did. You said all those words, but just not in the same order, and not in an order that made any sense. But thank you anyway for your contribution. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Right. I think I think we're reaching the end of our tether, aren't we? I think you're probably right. Yes. Yeah. I can feel exhaustion setting in. We're talking nonsense, so it's probably time yep. for us to go. Please send us your ten word kind warm lovely reviews about the nostalgia and fun and stuff on the podcast yeah. and uh we'll be back i guess next week for pod 124 yeah i suppose we ought to do 124 next week okay fine see you next week have a lovely week everyone we'll see you then bye <laughs> <laughs> did you hear my stomach yes i did <laughs> we'll keep that in bye <laughs> One complete. Let's go. Spectrum is green. I think that was Hungry, a dragon from Dragon's Domain, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's so funny. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what, Richard James, we, we are yeah. finishing this recording at just after 5pm. That's true. You're ready for your dinner, aren't you? Uh, I haven't eaten anything yet today. It's just oh, been too busy. Oh, bless. So that's why the dragon from Dragon's <laughs> Domain is here trying to tempt me in. That's great. I used to have, when I was growing up, and I'm sure many people out there used to have one too, uh, uh, an LP, a vinyl LP of BBC Doctor Who sound effects. Ah, I used to play for fun. I mean, it's strange, isn't it? And it used to include many a sound just like that one. (laughs) I'm sure sure that was the Sea Devils or something. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, I've got an amazing sound effect. (laughs) Yes. Which you'll have to bear with me while I find. So just do some filler for a second. Um, right, well, um, I suppose I could tell you that um, uh, what I'm having for dinner tonight, uh, might have a nice bit of cauliflower cheese, might make some homemade chips. Here we go. Uh, oh, oh, listen to this. <laughs> yeah. It's coming. What the... Well, that was my cockerel at 120 frames a second crowing. (laughs) (laughs) But it didn't sound that far off my stomach gurgle, I didn't think. Oh, great. It's a great sound, isn't it? Why are you keeping that? Just because it might come in useful one day? Yes, interestingly linked to the Terrorhawks reboot. Okay. There's an exclusive right there, but I shall say no more. <laughs> and I think now it's time for me to go and eat something, so I shall bid you farewell. I almost said bake well then, because I'm yes. so obsessed with food. Bake well. See you. See you next week. Bye. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.